This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today I am insanely excited about this one. I just got off the horn with one of the best interviews that that we've ever done on the show, frankly. I was so excited to do this interview, and then we did it, and it turned out very, very well, so I'm excited to share it with you. It is an interview with author, journalist, and humanitarian Holly McKay. So she is the now best-selling author of the book, Only Cry for the Living, Memos from Inside the ISIS Battlefield. So a lot of you guys will likely have heard of her by now because she was on the Jocko podcast. She's been on a lot of other podcasts that are kind of in that, that vein, those types of podcasts, and her story is incredible. And it's partially incredible because she doesn't really tell her story. She's telling the stories of the people that have had to live through one of the most horrific times in human history. One of the the worst times of human suffering. And that is what's been happening over in the Middle East with the rise and reign of ISIS. And so in terms of getting you comfortable with her, and I'll go into the little little bit of the interview here in just a second, I'm just going to read the bio from her website, okay? I don't normally do that. I like to kind of do my own thing with the bio, but I feel like this encapsulates a lot of what we're going to get into, and then we'll go from there. So I'll read it right here. Holly S. McKay is a foreign policy expert and war crimes investigator. She was an investigative and international affairs war journalist for Fox News Digital for over 14 years, where she focused on warfare, terrorism, and crimes against humanity. Holly has worked on the front lines of several major war zones and covered humanitarian and diplomatic crises in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, Turkey, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Burma, Russia, Africa, Latin America, and other areas. Her global, her globally spanned coverage in the form of thousands of print articles and essays has included exclusive and detailed interviews with numerous captured terrorists, as well as high-ranking government, military, and intelligence officials and leaders from all sides. She has spent considerable time embedded with U.S. and foreign troops, conducted extensive interviews with survivors of torture, sex slavery, and forced child jihadist training, refugees, and internationally displaced people to communicate the complexities of such catastrophic catastrophe, sorry, and war crimes on local populations. So there's a good time to kind of do a little aside. If you don't like hearing people read out loud, you're going to hate this podcast because I read out loud a bunch. I was taking a lot of chunks from Only Cry for the Living because I really wanted to see her respond to her own words in in a context where we could all maybe learn and glean some understanding from that. And so if you don't want to hear me struggle reading out loud, I I just ask for a little bit of grace. I'm not a professional read out louder guy. So just deal with me a little bit. But guys, I will say this as well from the very top. If you have children that you normally listen to this, because I know a lot of guys listen to this in the car or the truck while they're driving around with their kids. This is probably not the episode to do that. There are some pretty horrific things that we go over, um, and we basically go into the worst parts of what she described in her book. And I think it's it's incredibly important, because for me, I was shocked when I read her book. I was absolutely shocked as a guy that follows the news, as a guy that follows what's happening in the Middle East fairly closely, what I would say, and I've done a lot of reading on the subject. I was absolutely astonished by everything that I was reading. I just couldn't imagine how I could have missed out on some of these stories. And so, guys, this was a tremendous interview. I I was so glad that we got to spend some time with her. I know you guys are absolutely going to love this. So without further ado, let's get into it. Holly McKay, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. We have been looking forward to this for a while now, and I say a while even though you just came on my radar recently because you just released a new book, which you are going to get a lot into here in just a second. But I don't want to give too short a shrift to the early part of your life because that's a good developmental thing for you. But just to kind of quickly bring the rest of the audience up to speed, um, you grew up in Australia. You're from Queensland. Obviously, if people can't tell from the accent, uh, and you were big into ballet, especially early in your life, but you eventually found yourself in the United States, the good old United States, and you became a journalist. Journalist. The, the interesting thing about your journalism journey is you went from kind of being a, a Hollywood celebrity beat journalist, literally to, to the hell of the Middle East during wartime as, as a war correspondent. And you've said in previous interviews that you think your time in ballet taught you about toughness and resilience and that your time covering Hollywood and kind of the celebrity stuff kind of taught you to have a really good BS detector. So would you say that those two things have kind of combined to come together to make you a successful war correspondent or or war crimes investigator? Absolutely. I think even though from the outset they seem sort of polar opposites, they are definitely made me who I am. And and my years that I spent, I left home very young to sort of go and study dance and, and ballet. And I had a lot of independence. So that definitely teaches you to really fend for yourself. And it's a grueling profession. It is 
a grueling profession. And still to this day, I don't know right. that I've ever had to endure anything quite as physically demanding as, as ballet was for me. And I, I, but I loved it. You, you do it with a deep love. And uh, when that sort of career was over, I found myself sort of randomly uh, with a journalist job. And at that point, they were building up the digital uh, empire and they wanted people in Los Angeles. And I was barely 21, I think. And so they sort of said, you can have your own column and pretty much do whatever you want. So, you know, it was it was great. It was baptism by fire. Suddenly I was just, you know, having to put myself out there and meeting all these sort of fascinating people. And yeah, definitely you learn to detect the BS detector. I think for me, I always kind of felt like it was this straight crazy circus. And maybe that's a little bit like war sometimes too. You're in this, how are these people exist? How are they real? Like, you know, what is this? Um, but I think for me, it actually, it made me more of a grounded person. And that's sort of, I think, what compelled me to want to go overseas and, and do other things because I just, as I said, I, I felt like I was on the outside looking into the circus and mm-hmm. I, I never fit in. I didn't feel part of it. I didn't want to feel part of it. And so I knew that there had to be kind of more to the next trajectory of my career that I felt to be a little bit more fulfilling. So, yeah, kind of went went the other way. Well, it seems like you you definitely landed in something that could be called your calling if you, if you kind of have that worldview. And that's what led you to write the book, Only Cry for the Living, Memos from Inside the ISIS Battlefield. And guys, you have to go buy this book. Now, getting it right now might be a little bit hard to do because it is now a bestseller. It is sold out a lot of different places. So congratulations on that. And we have just this morning added it to our book list, which we have a a book list called 100 Books That Every Modern Christian Man Should Read. So that has been added to the history section. So another congratulations on that. But in terms of the book, it details the, the rise and reign of ISIS in the Middle East. And it really kind of puts legs on a group of people that we just got snippets of in the media and maybe didn't quite understand what was actually happening on the ground. And the interesting thing about the book, Holly, is the book is less narrative format and more of kind of journal entries, uh, a journal entry type of format. And you broke, you broke it down into sections that are separated by years going from 2014 through 2018. It's a unique way of doing it, but I found it very enjoyable as a reader. Cause for me, I struggle with narrative. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to kind of keep stories straight and keep, you know, these, these storylines going. So why did you decide to set the book up in that way? You know, I, I started going in to cover this particular conflict in 2014. And so after a couple of years, I found that I just had these piles of notebooks and it was sort of this scrolled handwriting of different people's stories that I would meet. And I would I would take notes when I went to places. I would take notes of what the food smelled like. I would take notes of uh, the expression on somebody's face and, and just kind of gather all these little details and just scroll them. And I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. And then I think around toward the end of 2016, when I was covering a lot of the Mosul Offensive, which was just starting at that point, I thought, you know, I want to put this together in a way that's not a sanitized news article that we're also used to reading. And I want to bring as many people into the the vortex as I can and really just explain these human stories. And I, I just felt that the best way to do that was to drag the old notebooks out and uh, and try to put mm-hmm. them together and and produce something that was a little bit more raw and a little less polished, a little mm-hmm. less, um, you know, as you would see as sort of an edited news story or even an edited essay somewhere and just kind of put people into that moment and what it was like in that moment without, I guess, all the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of looking back and the benefit of that we can look at it now and just kind of reflect what it was in that moment and how that felt. And so that just seemed sort of writing these memos seemed to be the best way to format. And because there are a number of them, I know that everybody has something different they're looking for when they're reading a book. Some people are really interested in the military components. Some people are more interested in certain religious groups, mm-hmm. uh, certain different you know, components of these conflicts. So I thought in a memo style, you can, even though it is chronological, you can kind of go back and forth and, and, and read the things that speak to you, at least initially, and then uh, hopefully fill in the gaps. Right. Absolutely. And the chronology was helpful for me as the reader, but also it kind of gave us a sense as to what you were experiencing on the ground because you didn't write this book. It didn't feel like you were writing a biography of the things that Holly McKay saw. It was you trying to be a fly on the wall, which I don't know if that was the intention or not, but I felt like it 
it allowed you to tell the stories in a more accurate way. Uh, the, the interesting thing about the book as well is that it is published on Jocko Willink's publishing company, uh, Jocko, Pub Jocko Publishing and another publisher as well. And he also wrote the foreword to your book. So he is, you know, we're all big fans of him around here and so is our audience. So I guess what is the story of you getting connected with Jocko and kind of making a connection to get this book out there to us? So the book is uh, is done through Jocko Publishing and also D'Angelo Publications as well. And uh, D'Angelo works a lot with Jocko in, in different things. And so this sort of seemed a, uh, a good fit, you know, and Jocko was interested in, in doing that under his umbrella as well. So it just kind of uh, was fairly serendipitous, fairly smooth in that way. And um, obviously Jocko has his very strong military background, but mm. he was interested in in kind of being able to convey something that also showed the human side of these conflicts and really what uh, atrocities happen on the ground. Yeah, and you certainly were able to do that. And at the end of the foreword, Jocko says this, it is not a comfortable read. It is not a pleasant read. It is an important read, but don't just remember it or don't just read it, remember it. Um, and the thing for me is I can corroborate that, that don't just read it, remember it, because it's a sticky book in that mm -hmm. these, these concepts and these people and these stories, they stick with you. And we'll get more into the specific stories here in a second, but these are not things that you can easily shake. I don't see how you could be a person that could read through the things that you've written down in this book and just go on about, you know, ordering dinner or going and getting groceries or mowing the lawn. Like these are ideas that stick with you. So I don't think you're going to have a problem with people remembering the book and to get into the book a little bit. You obviously spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours interviewing terrorists and government officials and NGO representatives and victims, adults, children. You talk to so many people, but how concerned were you that the people you were talking to were potentially lying to you or, or exaggerating or maybe holding back from you? Is that kind of where you had to bring in your, your Hollywood BS detector a little bit? Sure. I think that's a natural extension of any journalist is you, you need to be, you know, fairly discerning when you give any sort of interview, uh, especially in the Middle East, you have to, to sort of know how to, to get the right answers. And I think there's a little bit of a technique to that too. Um, you know, you have to build up a certain rapport and sometimes you have to go back and, and readdress a question if you feel that you're not getting the correct answer. I always take a fairly conversational approach to my interviews. I'm not the person who's going to go in there and stick it to the man for, a, you know, a 60 minutes hit you piece. Right. I'm going in there to, to have a conversation with you and to understand how you think. So I think immediately there's a sense of people wanting to open up to that because, uh, you know, I'm not there to judge. I'm not there to give you my opinion. I'm giving you a chance to have your voice and terrorists and other people, they want their voice heard just as much as anybody else. They want their perspective heard. And I mean, give someone a platform and, and trust me, <laughs> there's a lot of ego out there that wants to talk. So um, for me, that was kind of the conversation that I, that I, I took and I, a lot of the information I, you know, you can't always know if it's going to be 100% right. And often, especially in a terrorist interview, I would then go and interview some of the guards or some of the prison officials or some of the, you know, other people that were higher ranking in the intelligence mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get their sense on what he told me. Um, you know, they may say it's true. They may have their own spin on a situation. And I think at the end of the day and what we miss so much in these conflicts, I think, is that the media really has a job to, sometimes it's the only way that the other side is going to understand the other side, because if nobody's talking to each other, then they don't really know how the person on the other side of that front line is thinking. So I, I think, you know, true journalism to a degree should be that sort of communication vortex. And that should be a platform for people to be able to kind of get an understanding, whether you agree or you don't but at least get an understanding of where that other enemy or where the other person is coming from. And I think that's kind of what I tried to do, uh, you know, with my work and with the book. Yeah, you were very professional, obviously, in your approach, and you don't want to accidentally propagandize, you know, with some a crazy story from a terrorist that maybe doesn't uh, correspond with reality. So that's an important thing to get down as, as well. Now, as you read through the book, you describe being sad several times in the book. You don't, you don't spend a lot of time with your emotions, but you do kind of let that be part of the narrative that you give mm -hmm. to the reader. But you, you, I don't recall any admission in the 400 plus pages of your book where you said that you were scared. Now mm -hmm. you, you're uh, during this time and, and still you're, you're a young Western female, uh, you know, 
I'm sitting here thinking like, how is she not the next James Foley? And then a few pages later, you know, you mentioned James Foley and what happened to him, uh, kind of his unfortunate demise that he experienced in the Middle East. So I guess the simple question is, were you scared while you're there? Were you scared at any point? I don't want to say I wasn't scared because I think you need to have a healthy sense of fear. Um, and there were certainly moments of feeling a little on edge. But to be honest with you, I... I feel very calm in those situations and that's probably why I think it's a calling for me in some way to kind of be there and tell the stories because I'm not the person to panic. I'm not the person to kind of lose my mind when things go crazy. I'm usually the calmest one in the room. So that for me, uh, you know, and I, I was always very accepting of my decision to be there. Whatever happened, you know, I knew that it was a choice. I knew that I had made a choice and I felt that that was really the only choice for me. But I never want to take away from the people that have to live through it. So I kind of I've struggled with this is often people want to ask me about dangerous situations and being in, you know, a bombing or being whatever. And I guess for me, I'm always hesitant to talk about it because I think what I've experienced just pales in comparison to the people that live it day in and day out. And and every single night they go to bed, they're shelling and and. A sniper is pointing the gun at their house. And I just think, and they don't have the luxury of leaving. I have a luxury of leaving and they don't. So for me, you know, I, I guess I've, I've struggled with the idea of ever trying to aggrandize my experiences in any way, because no matter what I've been through, it will be nothing compared to the people that are living there. And, and I really wrote this book for the people that are living there. So, um, you know, and it was a struggle for me because especially if you saw sort of the first drafts of the book there really wasn't any of me in there and then a friend of mine came back and said you really need to put more of you in there and so I, I did but it was a struggle for me because again mm. I, I really think the kiss of death in journalism is sort of when people make themselves a story but I, I kind of also had to remember that this this wasn't exactly journalism it was a it was a book and I, I needed to insert my thoughts and feelings you know to a degree and yeah, it was a struggle because I, I really just wanted this to be about the people and I wanted it to be you know, their experiences and, and more so than mine. Well, I think you did that well because when you would talk so casually about, oh, I'm going to sleep on this ratty couch by this window, and but don't worry, like I can run down the hallway if things really popped off at any point. You brought us into the room with you. And I think that that was something that's important for us as a reader is some people don't have that that wild of a creative imagination to where they can put themselves there, mm -hmm. but you're helping us understand what it looks like, what it smelled like, what it felt like. Um, it really gave us insight into your state of mind. And also in the book, you, you give us insight into the state of mind of the victims of these mm -hmm. ISIS atrocities. And we're going to get into some actual quotes from the book now, but this one specifically is from the people of Mount Sinjar. And so we're going to go to the book here. Women were throwing their children from the mountains and then jumping themselves because it was a faster way to die, Katoon said, recalling the days after ISIS surrounded the foot of the mountain. Those who had nowhere to go but to the tops of the mountains slowly died from starvation and heat stroke, deserted by the saviors of the world and all its supposed modern technology. Um, and so... Guys, it, it's going to be more of that coming. So just just warning, this is not all, all peaches and, uh, and meadows at this point. But when when you're hearing stories like that from, from people, how do you categorize that in your brain? Because these are not just unfortunate happenings. These are literal atrocities. This is a literal genocide. So how do you process when, when people are telling you these stories, even though you weren't there physically to see what was happening? I mean, it's a huge struggle. I, I'm... I'm someone who's, who's a very, you know, very much an empath and I, I really try to identify with people's situations. And I, it was a struggle for me because I felt, I felt very helpless. I felt there wasn't really anything that I could do, you know, to comfort them or to make it better. But I guess for me, what I really had to reconcile with was that it wasn't my job to change a situation. I'm not a lawmaker. I'm not a policy person. I don't work for the government. And I had to take that weight off my shoulders and realize that it was simply my job to bring some awareness to it and to tell their story. And these are people who will never see justice for what was done to them. No one is ever really, you know, they might execute a few uh, jihadists, but n nothing really is ever going to bring back their mother or, or there's thousands still missing. So having their story told to a degree is, is a semblance of justice for them. At least they can then say, 
that people, you know, that their story just wasn't completely, uh, you know, off the edges of the earth. So I had to accept that, that that was my job and that that was all that I could do. And it's, it's very difficult. And then when you're dealing in the Middle East, I mean, even today, I have a thousand um, text messages coming through or WhatsApp messages about from people from other countries who want me to get the visas and, you know, the mother's in trouble and they send bombing pictures. And I think there's this real unrealistic expectation of many people that they have when they meet a, a Western person that, that they can help and they can send money and they can do this and this and this. And it's really hard for me because at some point, sometimes I have to block them because, you know, it becomes so relentless and it's really hard to say no. Um, and they can't understand why you can't help them. And that's, that's something I struggle with too, but you know, I have to compartmentalize and know that my life here is different to my life there. And there's only so much that I can do and there's only so much I can take on. So, um, yeah, I have to, I have to, I guess, be kind to myself in that way too. It's, it's an impossible place for any of us to be sitting here on this side to, to understand what you're going through, but also it, it's hard for me as the reader, and I'm sure everyone else that has read this book to really understand the brutality of what ISIS was doing. And uh, for, for this next section, this is an honest parental discretion for the next several minutes, because we're going to be getting into some of the more brutal parts of your book, because you do describe murders and genocides and, and rapes and kind of the worst kinds of things that people can do to each other. And so there were, there were three stories that I, I would like to kind of get your comments on, but just to kind of to paint a picture as to what you describe. And the first one is this. ISIS had abducted Yazidi girls as young as eight, trading them at the market for a few dollars. I learned of one young mother who was pregnant at the time of the capture. She had given birth in a back room of her overlord's house, but was not permitted to feed her newborn son. The baby cried and cried, Katun said flatly. The Muslim militant beheaded him. So let that sink in for a second and go to the second story. Differing accounts were a testament to the mistrust and fear that pervaded the city. Under ISIS control, Friday morning prayers were followed by mass executions in the public square. Sometimes people were locked in cages with ravenous wild animals. Sometimes they were blown up. Sometimes they were set on fire and other times they were driven over by armored vehicles. And um, before this, this last one that I read, Holly, and then I'll, I'll kind of get to my question. When I was preparing this um, yesterday, I was kind of, I like to read my questions out loud, just to kind of get the marbles out of the mouth a little bit. And I couldn't get through this, this next section the first time I tried to read it. Um, I, I had to go take a break. I had to go get something to eat, go walk around and then come back just because of how you described it and kind of what it did to you. And so I kind of had to do the, I think George W. Bush at his father's funeral, George H.W., he had read his speech, his eulogy over and over and over and over just to kind of desensitize it a little bit in his brain. So I kind of feel like I had to do that just so I could get through that. But I'm going to go ahead and get into that section here. To illustrate their loss, Baba pulled out phot photographs of the dead. Some were children. Some had been deceased for days. Their gray, distended bodies decaying, their faces buried in the dust, insects nibbling their rotting flesh. Others had succumbed to heat exhaustion. The life sucked from their limp little structures. Look, Baba Chawish said to me monotonously, as if he were merely pointing out paintings in a gallery. They cooked the children. The rage they, the rage he have, uh, he may have once felt bubbling in his gut was now stillborn. The incense had burned out. Baba Chawish seemed to understand there was no point in outwardly showing his anger. It would bring back the burned babies. Maybe someday he would forgive, but he would never forget. I counted seven shriveled babies curled into fetal positions in the photographs, tiny bodies still roasting beyond recognition on what appeared to have been a slate of tin shed. The silent tears wetting my cheeks had turned into guttural sobs I was powerless to control. I stared at the floor and sobbed. No one knew what to say. Those hushed seconds seemed to last forever. Perhaps it was unprofessional to cry so voraciously, but it was a flow I could not stop. I often scold myself for not having thicker skin. Of course, it is naive to think the world and all his children can be kept harbored from evil. But these babies, their broken bodies captured in full gorge of the sun, could have been saved. I am certain of that. And I was almost certain these graceful people would never see and even a little justice for what had been done to them. They knew it too. Finally, someone paused, passed a tissue and wi to wipe my tears. I glanced up through the glaze and saw the faces around me bereft of emotion. This is nothing. We don't react anymore, Umer said nonchalantly by way of explanation. There are far worse things that have happened. I realized then that the Yazidis were beyond the point of pain. Their grief had entered a place few in this world could ever comprehend. Their torment and desperation had dried up and dissolved. They had no emotion left to give. For them, there was no fog of war. Everything was reconstructed with precise attention to detail. The numbers of the missing and enslaved, 
and where they were exactly when their world stopped turning. Every abuse could be recited like a nebulous monologue, but without the theatrical cues and vocals. There was no need to dramatize what had happened to them. And so, Holly, I guess my question is, is again, you describe sadness in the book. You describe being there. You describe these atrocities. This is the first time, at least in this book, where you describe where you could not control the emotion anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. And those those previous two quotes uh, came in the book prior to the one that I just read, which is one of the most insanely grotesque things that I think could could even be put on paper. Help me process all of that and help me process what was going on for you in that moment where you just couldn't control mm-hmm. it any longer. I think at that point, um, it had been a couple of years that I had been covering it and, you know, you hear awful stories and, and the sadness and sort of the loss of hope and, and you take all those in. And then I think I remember that, that night when I got to Lalish when, to meet with Baba Chowish um, and he's telling me this stuff and it, it really there was, I, I still remember it really vividly, you know, the three men sitting on the floor and I just looked at that picture and I just, it was, it was a real turning point for me. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't control it anymore. I couldn't keep my composure. I couldn't, um, yeah, I was, I was just bowling and I, it took me a minute and I, I looked up and there was, you know, nobody else was crying. Nobody else was kind of even flinching. And I thought it was really the first time in my life that I had seen such sort of expressionless. And I realized it was just, that this had just become a place for these people that I, I couldn't even begin to understand, that that any any tears, any kind of emotion or anger, that just didn't matter. To the, you know, they weren't even able to produce that anymore because they were just so taken into sort of another parallel universe of, of kind of a pain and almost a self-protective mechanism, I'm sure. And that was just the first time I could really see that. And... And I felt terrible that I was the one falling apart when it was them and their families who were experiencing these atrocities. And yet they were sort of the ones comforting me. And I think that's a little bit of a disjointed ideal because you are from Australia, but you're now a U.S. citizen as well. And so you're you're very much a woman of the West. But there there is kind of an, an importance to this story about America and the importance of America to people in the Middle East. And so I'll read another short quote here from the book. Imagine if America didn't exist, said accountant Kurdu Amin Aga, whose home was outfitted with Israeli, American, and Kurdish flags, and who wears a U.S. Army t-shirt and a Navy SEAL watch. Without America, the world would be run by China or Iran. With dewy eyes, he turned to me in earnest. America represents freedom, he stressed. Our dream is to be eternally allied to America. And so I read a quote like that being a very patriotic American, and I'm like, Okay, that, that, that gets me excited that these people over there understand the American dream and freedom, but it kind of seems like we're currently in a political climate where Americans are being taught to hate America for, for her past sins and, and some of the horrible things that have been uh, propagated in the name of America. But while at the same time, America, people like me look at America as a general and overall net good for humanity, right? So to kind of talk a little bit about that because you've experienced being in the West and you live in the West, but then you were over there in the Middle East. So is America that important to people? Is that uh, accountant's opinion of America kind of common around the Middle East? Yeah. Well, especially in, in, in the Kurdish areas, which is the North of Iraq. And it's, I guess up until that point, you hear so much about, I guess, America, the perception of America in the Middle East uh, being fairly negative. And I, I always traveled in my sort of Australian passport and I would notice the difference between uh, when I was with American friends in, you know, not in that part, but in other parts of the Middle East and how differently I was treated when I pulled out my Australian passport compared to them. And so I guess we tend to have a sort of a stereotyped idea that that's what everybody mm-hmm. thinks. But but in, in, the, in the Kurdish areas, it was just, it was mind blowing. I mean, you walk into a store and there's American flags everywhere. You go into a cab and they've got the, the bald eagle as a, a seat cover. And it just is sort of, and everyone says, make sure you use your American passport. Um, so it was a sort of complete... Uh, counter to everything else and I I really think the Kurdish people kind of look to America well first of all they um, were very brutalized under Saddam Hussein Halabja the chemical attacks they you know it was it was a terrible during the Iraq Iran war so when you know the U.S. was able to take out Saddam to them that was a huge uh, caveat that was a a massive thing Mm -hmm. that you know 
didn't you know didn't have the same celebratory aspect even if we look back on it now when people are very debatable about Iraq the Kurds obviously really stand by that so they have a love mm-hmm. for America in this very pure sense um, I wouldn't say the rest of the Middle East shares that I wouldn't say outside of Iraq border share that but what I do notice in my travels and this is you know in Syria and a lot of other places is that the locals tend to sort of see the U.S. as this sort of superhero that's going to protect them in some way. So there is this sort of respect that that people have for the United States in these places. And, and they, you know, very firmly believe that, the, you know, the U.S. is the really the only ones capable of, I guess, saving the day. So even for ones that maybe aren't as outwardly patriotic to the U.S., I found that there wasn't you know, as strong as anti-American sentiment as as often the media or other people lead us to believe. Of course, there are groups that are very anti-American, but the general population, uh, I I don't always think has that perception. That's good to know. And that's good to get a little perspective on that. Um, I do want to go back to something because you triggered something in, in my brain from earlier when you were talking about how really at any moment you could leave right? You could leave the situation that you were in and you were, you were kind of smiting yourself for, for getting so emotional when these people were living it day in and day out. So whether there was another quote from the book here that kind of goes into that. Despite the reality slap accompanying all the horror, carnage, and devastation, there was something that still felt unreal about war and terrorism, something an outsider could never really make sense of. That made it hard to imagine stability. As outside, at, As outsiders, we had the luxury to walk away, record the suffering of another, analyze it, share it, and then escape it. And then just a few pages later, you say this, how easy it was for me to wander into their lives and then with the honk of a horn from an awaiting car, wander out. And so to to me, when I read that, it seems like you feel guilt over Mm -hmm. over having that type of access to these people to where you can kind of pop in and pop out. And it's kind of like people are sometimes critical of affluent individuals going to third world countries, almost like they're being voyeuristic at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, but did you feel like guilt always Mm -hmm. knowing that you could just come home at any moment? Yeah, to a degree I did. And I often never wanted to come home. And that was also the other thing, but yeah, I always, I never wanted to be that vulture. I never wanted, I felt so honored that people let me come in and, you know, would, would share with me the, the most intimate and horrific experiences that they'd been through. And I was a stranger and yet they would sort of welcome me with open arms. And I, I felt extremely honored by that. And so I never wanted to be, never wanted to be the vulture. I never wanted to just go into a situation and sort of take someone's story and then, you know, run away and disappear. And to a degree, you know, I had to do that. That was part of my job. Um, but I, I struggled with that too, because I thought, again, what, what is telling this story going to do? What impact is this story going to have? And I remember one of the, the women, the uh, Yazidi sex slaves women who opened up to me and I, I would meet with her several on several trips. And, and one time she sort of said to me, do you think this is going to make any difference? And I felt like I had to lie to her and say, yes, but I still can't say with, with, uh, you know, full conviction that her story is going to make any difference and that we are going to really change an approach to ending uh, sexual violence in wartime. But it's those stories like that that stick with me. And I do, I still feel a sense of guilt. Um, and I have to just try to remember that, you know, I almost have to kind of lead to two different lives, but I just, I want those, the people who share with me and welcome me into their lives to kind of know, I guess, how important that is and how honored I feel to, you know, it's an extreme privilege. Well, that makes sense. And I got to say for me personally, I, I'm typically not a big fan of, of awareness campaigns because mm-hmm. a lot of times it's like, okay, you're making me aware of this. Great. Now, what am I supposed to do? Right. But I do think that, again, I mentioned from the top of the podcast that we didn't really know this stuff was happening, right? Because even if you follow conservative media or pro-military media or something like that, you weren't hearing these stories. I was absolutely shocked because I consider myself to be a very in tuned person and I follow the news to, to not know any of these mm-hmm. stories. Some of these atrocities that were decades old, even that you mentioned in the book, I, I had no idea about. So I think mm-hmm. to a degree, I would have said the same thing to that woman without any hint of irony that yes, those stories do make sense because the, the book that you wrote is in a lot of ways, the story of brutality and human suffering. But I kept thinking about resilience the entire mm-hmm. time you were describing this book. I mean, everyone has their breaking point. They teach you that when they take you through, you know, a training. If you ever get caught behind enemy lines, everybody breaks at some point. But there was a quote from the book that I think elucidated this very perfectly. And it was this, 
Despite the morbidity of what the Yazidis were enduring, resilience seemed to envelop their whole beings. They may have grown fatigued with the idea of living and dying, yet giving up was not an option. They had started to accept what had happened to their community, the way it had been slashed so savagely, but they were not giving up. In the face of all the awful, there were many inspiring moments too, reminders of the resilience of the human body and mind. And so we teach resilience here with, with Undaunted Life. We, we teach men to forge spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, the ability to bounce back. But I'm usually talking about that in the context of, you know, finishing that book that's really hard to get through or, or finishing a really brutal workout or getting through some sort of family struggle, not even anything comparable to what you're describing. So I, I'm going to lean on you. I'm the guy that teaches guys how to be resilient. I need you to teach me about resilience because you got to experience something a little bit different. How can you imagine that these people were able to be so resilient considering what they were going through? You know, and this is actually a topic that I'm going to probably be exploring in my next book and go a lot more deeper into sort of that psychology of survival and resilience uh, in, in these particular situations. But, you know, it, it, it's baffling to me because you just meet these people and, and maybe it's multiple times in their lives that they've had to flee their home. Maybe they fled during the Iran-Iraq war. Maybe they fled again uh, after the 2003 invasion. And then they fled again when ISIS came. And so, you know, how you just be able to pick back up and start back over again. And there's always this sense of distrust, I think, that, that people often have. It's how do you know that you're going to start again and that someone's not going to come and rip that away from you again. And I just think it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's almost a sad acceptance that a lot of people have had to have or to forge within themselves that this is just their life and this is the, the geopolitics of their life and that doesn't stop them from wanting to rebuild. And I think there are those basic core human instincts that we all have and that is to basically to survive and to care for our family and to fight for what we mm-hmm. believe in. And I see that in people and I see... Uh, just that resilience of the human spirit. And I see the depth of, of what they're sort of willing to endure. And it's baffling to me because most of us here obviously could never imagine what that kind of life would have to be like. But for them, sadly enough, it's often the only life that they know. And it's, it's a certain acceptance to their situation and to know that the only way they can really get through it is to get through it. They're, these are people that aren't, aren't trained in any, you know, special craft to, to forge that resilience, it's a simple knowing of this is the only choice I have. The choice is just to do it. And to me, that is just, it's a remarkable thing. Yeah, I think baffling is the exact perfect word to describe it, as you mentioned. And I do want to go into something else from the book here, because I thought that this was a very poignant moment in your book. Uh, so I think it's it's important to go through, but it's his. <sighs> A few days earlier, a six-year-old girl lost a leg to a landmine, he said. And a few days before her, young, uh, before her, a young woman had her left foot blown off. I examined the wincing photographs of the victims Akif kept on his phone. I studied the anguish that crossed their blood-freckled faces, a synthesis of shock, pain, regret, and fear. For the first time, I did not flinch. I felt nothing. I had always told myself that I would never get to that point. I would never become so jaded by the pain of others that my first reaction was no reaction. And so Holly, essentially there, you were describing in real time, becoming desensitized to violence. And a lot of people like to talk about this, you know, when they're looking at stories of young child soldiers or kids playing video games Mm -hmm. that they're becoming desensitized to violence, but you were experiencing it and you're describing to us what was going on. So take us through that a little bit further. I think once you sort of start to see the same kind of deep sadness over and over again, and people are sort of all sharing the same stories. And in fact, one of the guys sort of said to me, you know, why, why are you asking these questions? We all have the same story. Um, and that was just this sort of story of extreme loss and pain and, and unknowing. And, and after a while, I, you know, I did, I did start to just feel, I guess, the helplessness. And you start to just feel like the world is kind of crashing in on you. And, and, and at that point, that's what I was, I was feeling because stories would just become more horrific and more horrific. Or I'd be in a hospital with, with victims or on the front line and see, you know, it just, it became kind of into a vortex of, of just sadness. And, and, and that was something I had to sort of eventually pull myself out of and realize that, that there was a light and there was a lot of light in these people too. And, you know, that's people in dark situations can often really find 
uh, the lightness to it. And I just at that point couldn't see it. Um, so yeah, I had to really struggle with that. And then I, I think in that particular trip, I was able to bounce back really fairly quickly. And cause I always promised myself that I would never get to, to that point, uh, in that way. And I think I was able to pretty much bounce back. It wasn't really until the summer of 2018, I was working in Africa and I was interviewing a remarkable woman and, and she had babies out of rape and it was just atrocities. And I remember feeling, you know, I'm sitting there with my notebook and I didn't have that sort of same familiar vault of, you know, empathy, I think that I've always had since I was a child. And I just thought, you need to take a break from this. Like this is, uh, this isn't a normal reaction. And um, yeah, that's a struggle for me. So even when I'm crying or I'm, I'm upset about, about something that's happened in, in conflict that is that feels pretty healthy to me. It's just the yeah, the times that I really don't feel that or I feel that I can't connect or something uh, on that level that that I know it's time to take a break. Well, I was going to ask you, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, that you did bounce back fairly quickly because I was going to ask you, you know, did you bounce back? Do you feel like you kind of bounced back from that? Because a lot of these things are going to permeate a lot of different areas of your life. It's not just what you're experiencing in that moment. And so that's why, as I was reading your book, I was, I was still trying to read through the lines as to, okay, why are you bringing up this story? Because this doesn't maybe fit with what I've read in the past, you know, 15 or 20 pages. And so at Undaunted, at Undaunted Life, we exist to equip men to push back darkness. That's why we're here. And we do that, like I said earlier earlier by providing content that helps men forge spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So it's safe to say, from my perspective, that you saw the absolute worst parts about masculinity in your time overseas. Um, and I'm assuming you also saw the, the works of good men pushing back against the darkness that I described as well. Um, so I just want to read this short story from the book while you were interacting with some Yazidi women and girls after they had been freed from sex slavery. So back to the book here. Through the gap in the door flag, I noticed that scores of men and boys had lined up outside, maintaining a respectful distance from the distraught women, but with curiosity etched into their faces. They clearly wanted to be involved somehow, to be part of the healing process, to remind us that men weren't the enemy. Bad men were the enemy. These were the fathers and brothers and sons, the nephews and neighbors. Just as the ladies and their lives were wounded, they too were hurting over what had happened. These were the men and boys who longed to protect their female counterparts, but when ISIS came, their innate duty was torn from them. In those lurid days under attack, they had been rendered helpless. That would be something they would carry for the rest of their lives. So my question to you, Holly, is what are your views on masculinity in light of everything that you've seen with your own eyes while you were overseas? Right. So, uh, I mean, I'm a big believer in... And I think this is something that gets overlooked a lot, especially in the Middle East. And there's this incredible and amazing push that there has been in recent years on the education of girls and, you know, helping girls to kind of go to school and, and be, um, you know, have that forge of independence. And I think it's really great. But I think what's lost a lot in the, the shuffle is, is boys as well. And, you know, I found that a lot of these young boys, especially when ISIS came, you know, if the father was out fighting or the father was killed or injured, then you had these eight-year-olds who were suddenly the breadwinners of the house and they were out haggling on the street and they're never going to go back to school. They're never going to see, um, you know, much of a better life than probably spend the next 30 years of their lives haggling in the street also. So to me, I think what's been lost a lot is sort of the education of boys. And I also think if we really want to change a lot of the, say, sexual violence or domestic violence in the Middle East, which is very prominent, um, a lot of the change has to come from... You know, we have to empower and educate and from a young age, you know, help men to or boys to want to protect their wives and protect their mothers and their sisters and their daughters and, and kind of see that as the empowering thing as opposed to, uh, you know, resorting to violence or, or any other things that are really common uh, in that particular part of the world. So I'm a really big believer that I think the boys and their education and, and that kind of empowerment is lost a little bit. And I think it's so important in these, um, mm -hmm. I guess, more patriarchal societies that if you want to instill real change, as, as crucial that is that that is for, for girls to really make a huge dent, you know, within the next 10 to 20 years on the way that these things are viewed, you've, you've really got to focus on the boys. And, and that is kind of a reality that in the West, 
often, you know, do-gooders and, and people that have great intentions always don't want to reckon with. I certainly agree with that. We get questions all the time about how to raise sons and what do we do? You know, we're, we're fighting against what's being taught maybe in public schools or maybe what's being taught in certain churches. And that that's, again, one of the main reasons why we're here is because these boys will become men. And if they're learning these lessons at such a young age, it will affect them as they go through. And it a lot of it has to do with worldview, which kind of leads to the next side of what I want to talk about, which is, you know, while you were in the Middle East, you were surrounded by people from a plethora of different worldviews. I mean, Christians, Muslims, Yazidis, sure there were some atheists here or there, you know, or maybe most of them were atheists and, and Satanists, you know, people like uh, ISIS. I can't imagine that those people had uh, had a realistic worldview behind mm -hmm. what they were doing. But I'm sure that you would say that you saw the best and worst from people yeah. out of all those groups. Um, but I wanted to know mainly how all these interactions affected your personal faith. And so a quote from the book is this, on July 26th, ISIS, ISIS assailants had attacked churchgoers in the sleepy town of Normandy in the north of France. They stormed the 16th century church of St. Etienne de Rouvre and slit the throat of 85-year-old priest Jacques Hamel in broad, light, or broad morning light. I found myself deeply impacted by the priest's death. It kept me awake for nights on end as I envisioned his pain, his fear, his bravery. It had triggered something in me, a staunch defensiveness to protect my Christian roots, even though I had not considered myself religious or practicing in a theological sense. But it had made me want to stand up for something that had been a small part of my childhood, something that was now not only under attack, but under the umbrella of genocide. And so you very briefly mention, Holly, your personal, you know, worldview and maybe a little bit of your childhood. So uh, as our listeners would like to know, kind of what is your worldview when it comes to those types of things? And then specifically, how did your faith change due to your time spent over there and, and what you saw? Sure. So I mean, I grew up in Australia. Um, I went to, I was in the Anglican Church of England. And, you know, as a child, I went to Sunday school and I, I was a little bit rebellious, I guess you could say, a bit wild. And so I ended up <laughs> You know, not wanting to wake up on a Sunday morning anymore. So, um, yeah, but I, but I always, you know, it was always something I carried with me. But, yeah, never practiced it, never really, um, it wasn't sort of part of my life, in, especially in my 20s. But I think there's something about Iraq, I guess, specifically in sort of this idea of a cradle civilization. There's a, it's very hard to describe there's a sense of intuition that I have when I'm there that I just, I don't have anywhere else in the world or that I don't have here. There's just this, you feel the weight of the beginning of time. It's, it's, it's just something very, uh, something, you know, the second I get off a plane, there's just something very um, out of this world about it. And, and my, my sense of intuition, I mean, it saves my life. My intuition saves my life. And I, I wish I had that intuition, you know, everywhere I am, but there's just something about being in Iraq and being in that war zone that just, it just, I can't describe it. And, and for me, it was always very overwhelming that there was always sort of something that I could never put my finger on. And then a lot of the work that I was doing as well, on top of that, was with a lot of the Christian communities, which have obviously been really persecuted over time there. So I think pre-2003, there was something like 2 million Christians in Iraq. And that really has gone down to probably somewhere between 100,000 and, and 200,000 now. And a lot of them don't want to be there. Uh, many have fled. Many will never go back. And life for the ones that are there that I talk to every day, um, it's, it's really tough. It's really difficult. And I just, I felt saddened by that. I felt saddened by sort of these people not being able to be free in their land. And as, as one of my good friends, who's a, a priest in a, in a church just outside of Mosul, always says, you know, we, we were the original people here and now, you know, nobody's protecting us. We don't have the government protecting us. We have militias that are manning our checkpoints. And I just felt kind of sad for them in the sense that, that they were being persecuted or nothing but their faith. And that's something I really wanted to highlight in the book as well is, um, you know, the trials and tribulations that the community has gone through. And again, their, their resilience for the ones that are still there and still trying to, trying to stick it out. Well, Holly, it's interesting that you bring this up, and I don't exactly know what to do with this information, but you talked about intuition, about how you had some different feeling while you were over there. Um, I've I've listened to a lot of folks like uh, Nabil Qureshi, and there's some church planners in like Iran and different places. And these people talk about how there's this constant difference about how 
people in those areas come to faith in Jesus. And it's, it's not usually the, the hellfire and brimstone, you know, pastor, like you would see maybe in Missouri and in, you know, over here in the United States or someone that's on tour in Australia. It's, it's God is working through dreams. He's working through feelings. He's working through such a different thing. And so I, I don't know actually what to do with that, because mm-hmm. when you say the word intuition, it seems like it fits into that category, mm-hmm. but I, so you're saying, so I guess just even go a little bit further, cause I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So when you come back home, it's not just a feeling of coming back home. Does it feel like almost, almost like something's been unplugged a little bit? I just feel like almost, I feel like when I'm in, in Iraq or in Syria and these walls, I feel very protected. It's, it's a strange feeling. And I feel, uh, I guess that I'm maybe more in tune with myself uh, in those mm-hmm. situations than just day to day life. And maybe that's just because of the surroundings and you're sort of in this uh, chamber where, you know, a lot of the external things that we worry about in our daily lives here, I don't worry about when I'm there. You, you're sort of focused on survival. But I do, I, I always felt, yeah, incredibly protected. And, and um, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples of that. It's, I remember one particular situation where, I really wanted to, you know, go to Talafer and I was begging everybody that, I, you know, whoever came by, I wanted to go, I wanted to go. And for weeks and everyone said it was too dangerous and the road was too dangerous and I shouldn't go. And then eventually a car came to the house I was at and said, well, we're going to Talafer if you want to come. And, you know, I had all my bags and I was ready to go and I'd been bugging everyone about it and I just didn't go. I just looked at it and mm. I thought I'm I'm not going to do this now. I don't know why. And I felt I was beating myself up and I felt really like, you know, you're, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're being weak kind of thing. Anyway, that car ended up being ambushed and and nobody ever saw those people again. So um, in a strange way, I felt extremely protected. And also, you know, in another case that I I write about a little bit in the book was um, I just sort of these reoccurring nightmares in my book. And I guess that was from being in, again, in that vortex of sadness and in the in the dreams, you know, I kept having these horrific and very real dreams of my mother, um, of my mother dying, and my sister telling me, and it just you know, this being overwhelmed with grief, and and then I, you know, I talked to a friend about it, and it, who's you know great with these things, and at home, and I saw, and she said, you know, that was sort of a, a protection for me in a way because what ended up happening was a few days later, I was by myself and I was just doing washing on a mountain, mm-hmm. and I went to take the stuff out of the dryer and I could just feel, you know, I couldn't open the dryer door and no one was around. And I just, I thought of that, these reoccurring dreams that I'd been having of my mother. And I thought, I just thought of that dream randomly in the middle of it. And as I kind of went to pull the stuff out, I used the back of my hand and ended up getting blown completely black. Um, And my, you know, the whole power grid melted down. And I thought, you know, if I hadn't thought of that dream, if I hadn't flicked my hand around, I I would have been completely sucked into that machine. So it's little things like that that I, you know, I'm very aware of. And I I feel, yeah, almost a sense of protection that that I I hadn't experienced really up until that point in such a, um, I would say, literal way. Mm hmm. Well, to, to be honest, as you're describing it, I can't think of really a time that that even computes with that to where I kind of felt that same thing. But I've heard that type of story a lot. And that story is typically in the context of someone feeling like God was protecting them in that moment. So, and I've told this to people that don't believe in God, that do believe in God and everything in between that even if you don't believe God's taking care of you, doesn't, it's not going to stop him from taking care of you. And so in those moments, there's no logic Mm. that can be applied to why you didn't get in that car. Mm. Because if someone had been following your life, Holly, up into that moment, the only logical conclusion was that you were going to hop in the back seat. Let's go, let's get after it. And then we don't hear this story, Holly. Mm. Like we don't get to read through the stories that you've been able to share. Mm. Your notebooks might just be lost lost to history mm-hmm. or just have been you know, set ablaze in another ISIS fire or something like that. So um, I, I really appreciate you sharing that, that with us because I think that that's an important thing. Um, as we kind of wrap up the book a little bit, I was going to ask you about why you decided to title the book Only Cry for the Living because it's a very unique title, but I've since decided against it. Yeah. And, and the reason is, is because fellas and everyone else listening to this, that is your payoff for buying and reading this book, okay? The answer to why this book is called Only Cry for the Living is revealed on the last page at the very bottom right before the epilogue. So read the book, 
earn the right to know why. So I do want to transition out from there and want to get into a subject matter that I feel like you're in a unique place to give me some perspective, just sitting here in my studio here in Oklahoma. And it's that many times in the book, but also I've heard this many times other places, it's been said that groups like ISIS and groups like them, you know, Al Qaeda and Boko Haram and the Taliban, whatever, that they're Islamic extremists Mm -hmm. or not true Islam. I think not true Islam was a direct quote from somebody in your book. And the issue with people saying that is that the ninth surah of the Quran actually exists. Okay. And it's the last surah that Muhammad gave to his people before he died. It's, it's the least abrogated and it was intended to be the marching orders for Muslims after Muhammad died. And it is the most vicious and bloody surah of the entire Quran. And the verses specifically in the ninth surah command Muslims to fight and kill non-Muslims, you know, infidels saying that Allah a created Islam to prevail over all other religions and that Muslims are required to kill in battle, that it's not just a polite suggestion. And there are people, Muslims included, that claim that Islam is a religion of peace, right? We hear that a lot. And that the, but the thing is, is the followers and proponents of that ideology are following the writings that are much earlier in Muhammad's life. And those writings have were abrogated. Basically, abrogation means, yeah, all that stuff I said in the past, don't don't listen to that stuff. Listen to what I'm saying now. So kind of a long way to set up a, a short question. But in light of that, would it be fair to say that groups like ISIS aren't extremists at all? Instead, that they're fundamentalists when it comes to teachings and dictates of Muhammad or the Quran. I think there is just so many branches of, of, of Islam. You've got the Diabanis, you've got the Sunnis, you've got the Shia. So you've got all these sort of different ideas and and there's a lot of, you know, with internal conflict within within the religion itself in trying to to um, create absolutes of who's right. So you could definitely look at it and say that some are extreme fundamentalists and, and others aren't. And again, you know, things come down to interpretation, literal interpretation versus uh, theoretical interpretation versus just the passage of time um, and how, you know, we, we sort of change the ideas. So you could look at it as... I would say a combination of fundamentalism and extremism. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I obviously want to stress that it's only a small, you know, portion. And I, I obviously, am, you know, Muslims protect me day in and day out when I'm in these places and, you know, they're the biggest victims of these conflicts um, much more than we are. But I definitely think that uh, you can't disregard the religious aspect. I would say, you know, oftentimes with the reasons for joining, I wouldn't always say it's the factor of joining. I would often say it's a factor of joining. And I think there is quite a discrepancy often between. So when we have a a sort of a lone wolf attack or something in the West, it's usually driven by that sort of uh, extremism or fundamentalism. But I, you know, and I think this sort of creates this idea that everything has to be then about religion. And I, I beg to differ on the ground. I think a lot of people pledge allegiance because, just pure survival reasons a group comes in takes over your village you're working in a hospital you're making uh, 50 bucks a month and you've got to keep making that 50 bucks a month to put money on the table and so there are just general social factors and a lot of the terrorists I interviewed didn't seem to be sort of religious one way or another whatsoever Um, and then you have you know the others that are complete so I think the, the nuances are, are difficult and hard to have our reds, hard to wrap our heads around and there isn't really a black and white answer to it all. No. Um, but I think you can't disregard that aspect by any means, but it's not it's not the only sort of motivator for, for a lot of the fighters. Right. I think that's a fair way of putting it. And one thing to, to kind of transition, we're, we're kind of getting towards the end here, but there seem to be kind of these warring parties within your book of these interventionalist thoughts and isolationist thoughts. Mm. There's this constant like, okay, how involved should America and her allies be in what's going on? What should be our continuing and ongoing involvement in these types of things? And it does come down to, are you an interventionalist or are you an isolationist? And so from your perspective, I know it's impossible to say one way or the other because there's so many good arguments for for both sides, Mm. but what is the best side to be on? Because I find myself in both camps and I don't really like that. Sure. No, I'm with you on that. And I've definitely vacillated and it's been something that I've, it's really torn me up because, you know, I think I know where I stand and then something happens and I go, Oh my goodness, but how can we let this happen and not do anything? So it's definitely something that I I struggle with. I, I guess I sort of look, look at a lot of it now. And I look at a lot of the mismanagement. I look at the money spent and obviously the lives that have been wasted on it and, do I think it was, you know, 
it's hard for me to say that, that any of these places are better off, you know, with American uh, intervention. So from just that point of view, I don't, I don't think we need a military presence in a lot of these places anymore. I think if it, if you are going to take a military presence, it needs to be a very small footprint and it's got to be the locals doing the work. So I think the Syria model that we had during ISIS, where you had 2000 troops kind of on the ground, but they were in the background. It was the Syrians that were doing the fighting. The U.S. was there to sort of do the advise and assist and really act as a very, what I think to be effective deterrent. So the people that were there, knew the U.S. was there, even if they never saw any of the, of the soldiers. And they knew that while the U.S. was there, they weren't going to have to deal with the Assad regime coming in or the Russians coming in or the Turks coming in. And so I think mm-hmm. that there was a, a relief for them in that in that respect. That would be a potential model in other places going forward. Do I think these sort of sweeping um, military presence are effective? I, I think we can look at the last 20 years and probably all come to a conclusion that that probably isn't going to work going forward. But I do think that there is, you know, we do have USAID, we have um, NGOs. I mean, for a small portion that could be removed from a DOD budget, instead of, you know, having soldiers sort of try to do these hearts and minds projects, how can that money be a little bit more re- reorientated to have the locals doing that or kind of take the the military component out of that so that you can offer some assistance to people because obviously uh, we, we want to see these you know, protect these people to a degree, but I don't know that the sweeping military presence is is the answer anymore. And I think that, yeah, we can definitely look at the ramifications of that uh, to see. And I, you know, and I I think there's this argument that people give, well, the U.S. only wants to be involved in something when it impacts the U.S. And I, I think the U.S. should only be involved in something that impacts the U.S. And it's very hard to, because just so much of the world has problems and it's heartbreaking. And again, I do think that there are, the U.S. can lead the way in terms of you know, humanitarian efforts and, and empowering NGOs to kind of get the access and, and help. But as terms, as far as military goes, you know, we can't just expect to to send you know our very good men and women out there to fight something that isn't going to have a clear goal or a goal that's of interest to the American people. Hmm. I appreciate your perspective on that because, I, again, as an American, it, it's hard for me to know what to do because I want to support the troops, but that's not always kind of a unilateral uh, way of thinking. Uh, but I, I promised myself that if we had some time that we would get to two of my favorite groups that you described in this book. And I don't want to give you uh, too small of a time to describe that, but I do want to kind of at least give a primer to our audience. And that's the Black Devils and the Sun Ladies. Okay. And I was absolutely enamored with the story of these two people groups. So give our give our listeners a little bit of a primer as to who the Black Devils are and who the Sun Ladies are and what your experience was with them. So the Sun Ladies, I first encountered them. It was the beginning, gosh, was that 20, end of 2015, beginning of 2016. And so a friend has sort of introduced it, made an offhand comment, well, there are these Yazidi women who've just formed their own fighting unit if you want to go meet them. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. So I drove up to Duhok to kind of go to their base. And there were all these Yazidi women who many of them, still had their family members missing. Many of them had their sisters, their mothers, all taken by ISIS. Many of them had been held as as sex slaves themselves and had been rescued or escaped. And they wanted to create their own fighting unit ahead of the uh, liberation of Sinjar, which is their ancestral homeland where most of the Yazidis tend to live on the mountain or in the villages around the mountain. And they wanted to be part of that liberation. And that was a deeply personal issue for them. And so there was one woman by the name of Captain Cartoon, and she had no military experience. She was an opera singer, and she just kind of begged and begged to uh, Peshmega, uh, which is the Kurdish uh, militia, begged and begged to you know get the resources to ha- open her own kind of wing. And immediately, you know, dozens of girls ended up signing up, and they got training and learned how to use weapons, and and really you know went to the front line and to be part of that. And that was a, a deeply cathartic experience, I think, for them. Um, and, you know, it was obviously there was a part of that 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 wanted to be able to fight back. But it was it was really a, a sense of, of dignity for them. And, and one of them said that was the I guess a model she wanted to use for for other groups of persecuted women around the world to to empower and to, you know, if they if their women were going to be freed mm-hmm. from a city, they wanted to be uh, they wanted to be on the front lines and in, in doing that. So. Yeah, it was, it, they were just incredible. And often in many of my trips, I'd go back to, to see them. And the last time I saw them, there were just thousands of, of uh, 
women wanting to volunteer. And it was just, it was, it was remarkable. That's incredible. And then, then you had the black devils. So give us a little bit of an idea as to, to those guys. Yeah. The black devils were a, a really cool, uh, sort of special forces group. Um, and they were based in, in Telescoff when I met them, which was a Christian town that had been, uh, taken by ISIS and they'd just taken it back, but it, the town was obviously empty and it was still, uh, very dirty with landmines. And so they just taken over a couple of the houses as kind of a base for them. And that was very, a very heated front line at that time. But uh, they were really remarkable. They were kind of the group that um, you know, would be called upon for, for urgent missions. Uh, and they were holding this town and were, every night we're out there fighting back. And, and they just, I had a great time with them. And they you know, took me around and they showed me all the different places. And then just the, you know, the funny little things that we learned, all the code words that we used in the fight with ISIS. And, and they had special names for things. And, and one of them would put up, uh, the, go out, to the, the battlefield and put up the Peshmega flag. And then the next day you'd sort of wake up and the ISIS flag would have be put instead of the Peshmega. So it was, they were back and forth, kind of very uh, mm. symbolic debate, but they were really extraordinary. And, and they'd sort of just given up their, as, as many of the surg- soldiers had, had given up their entire lives to be part of this specialized unit. And, you know, they were working often, they were often on a front line 16 hours a day. Maybe they'd sleep for three and four. Maybe they'd get a two days off every couple of weeks. But really, that was their life. And you often found that there were fathers and sons. And, and you know, it was, it was a multi-generational group. And it was just a, something I really wanted to highlight was, was the work that they were doing in the fight. I feel like you could have literally written a book on each one of those two groups. And and maybe one day, if we can convince you to keep going back over there, we'll actually get that book. But we are going to start to bring the, the podcast to a close here. And I, I do want to ask really this, this last question, because it's fairly seminal to the work that you did. You broke up your entries in this book several dozen times throughout the book to ask this simple question, which is, what is war? And there were so many different responses. Some of them were, you know, what is war? It is turning the only thing no terrorist can take, or it is turning to the only thing no terrorist can take, faith. What is war? With the Iraqis, there was never a discussion of medals of honor. Only endless videos and photos of soldiers killing ISIS and dragging the dead bodies into the backs of pickup trucks or capturing them alive and letting them sob like helpless children begging to be spared. That was their medal of honor. And another one here, what is war? War does not rest until the dead are dead and the living are like the dead. So last question of the day, Holly McKay, what is war? I think war is the, the epitome together of the, the best and the worst of humankind. I think that is a great and powerful place to put it. I don't think there is another way to say that, but we really appreciate you letting us go into all of these subject matters. I know it's hard to keep going back over these stories that you've lived, but it's important for people like me. It's important for our listeners to get a deeper sense of what you went through, but that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, thank you for having me and for really for highlighting these people's stories. And and I think yeah, it's an it's an honor to be able to share to share it, and I just hope that it gives people a deeper sense of the impacts of war, uh, in both the lightness and the dark. Holly McKay, thanks for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thank you. There you go, guys. I tried to tell you this was an amazing conversation. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I mean, I was just. I was overwhelmed throughout that conversation and I was overwhelmed most of the time while I was reading that book. So I'm glad we were able to get her on to talk a little bit more about that. I'm sure we'll have her on at some point in the future as well to talk about some other projects of hers. But before we let you guys go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. As you know, by now we are a men's ministry and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. And specifically we do that by providing you content like this podcast that helps you forge spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So I'm going to go through the links that we have for you today. I've got a link to Holly McKay's website. So you can get a lot of information about her there. Then I've also got a link to the book. So I've got it on Amazon and D'Angelo Publishing, because here's the thing. Amazon does some kind of weird things with with orders, because this book sold out almost immediately. And so uh, 
and we kind of talked off air about that. Amazon's being a little bit funny with how they're listing books and how they're selling them and all that. So I've also got the link to D'Angelo Publishing, which was, you know, one of the ones that they published with Jocko Publishing. So you can order the book directly from their website, but I will just let you know, if you're not ordering it on Kindle or something like that, it may be a bit before you can get that. I think it's May. If you're listening to this on time, it might be May before those are put into production because again, they, they were just absolutely sold out. You couldn't find a copy, but guys, it is absolutely worth it if you want to wait. I've also got a YouTube link to the Jocko Podcast that she did. That's Jocko Podcast 271. And then I've got a link to her Instagram account so you can follow her there. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. I really do appreciate it. If you would, please subscribe wherever you're listening to this. If we deserve a five-star review, please leave us one and let us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2021. So if you want me to come speak on your podcast, at your men's event, at your team, whatever, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. The email is info at undaunted.life. The website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Twitter at Undaunted Life or Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. Check out our free devotionals on the Uversion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. Keep seeking the Lion of Judah.